They help us remember that the Proverbs were written as a father having a conversation with his son, passing along that wisdom that's essential for living a good life. Now, when you read them, you're going to notice that Solomon sometimes writes about a complete topic, but sometimes it's almost as if he's in the middle of a conversation when he remembers, oh yeah, I need to talk to them about that. And so the Proverbs are filled with wisdom, but sometimes we have to go and seek out what he says about a particular topic because it's so interspersed with the rest of the information. That's why those references are put at the top of your sermon notes. So you'll know where those things come from. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Today is no different as we look at issues of integrity and work ethic. Those verses are spread all throughout the Proverbs. However, Solomon does give us one good solid conversation from which to base our understanding. It can be found in Proverbs 2 verses 1 through 7. And so if you have your Bibles with you, this would be a good time to turn to them. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 7, and I'm going to keep on reading there. Solomon writes, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands with you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then... You will understand the fear of the Lord, and we know that's the beginning of wisdom, right? And you will find the knowledge of God. It says the Lord gives those things to us, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And then it says something absolutely pertinent to our discussion today. It says he holds success in store for the upright. Now, I don't know anybody in here that doesn't want to be successful. If there are, would you just raise your hand and we'll pray for you. I didn't think so. If I read this correctly, our part in living successfully is to do four things. To accept what God speaks through his word. That means we need to read it, doesn't it? Yes, I knew you knew that. To store up his commands within so when we read it, it's not just an exercise in academia. Third, to apply his wisdom to our lives. And James reminds us, don't just hear this stuff, do it. And lastly, to search for wisdom as if it is treasure, because if we want to live successfully, it is treasure, isn't it? Okay, listen to what God says he will do if we do these things, and these are found in verses 8 through 11. He guards the course of the just, protecting the way of the faithful. Does that describe you, the just, the faithful? Because there's a promise attached to that. He guards and he protects our ways. He'll be, he will make sure, pardon me, that you are able to understand what is right and just and fair. Because how hard is it to discern sometimes what really is right? Especially in the culture that we live in. It's not always easy. And yet the word of God says if you're walking in these ways, I'll make sure that you know what is just and what is fair and what is right. He says that wisdom will enter your heart, and that's important because there it can guide our decisions. And lastly, he says that such knowledge won't be a hardship. Sometimes we think that those commands of God are burdensome, don't we? Especially as we look back into to the Old Testament, mm, not too sure about those things, and yet... Solomon says that if we treat it as the treasure it is, that it will be pleasant to us because we'll know it's for our best, just like any father wants for his son. Does that make sense to you? Jesus speaks to those same priorities in Luke 10, 27, when he answers the question, what's the most important command? What is it that we need to pay attention to if we're going to live well? And Jesus' response is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And that's where the Proverbs say that we will store that word so that everything that we do is wholeheartedly then devoted to our God. He says, love the Lord your, your God with all your soul because that's where those wrestles of integrity take place, aren't they? He says, love the Lord your God with all your mind. This, this is my Bible. <laughs> Love the Lord your God with all your mind. Proverbs says to use this. So that you know what's right and just and fair. And I want to give you another illustration here. 
This is a little dirtier than I thought it was. I should have washed it better. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> this idea of what's right and just and fair is sometimes a real stumbling block for people. So I've heard it said this way. If we want to be a Christian, we have to check our brains at the door. Or in order to believe the scripture, we have to check our brains at the door. Now, I don't believe that's right because Jesus says we're to love the Lord our God with all of our mind. And so I don't think that includes checking our brains at the door. Do you? All right, so how do we do that thing? Um, this is a strainer out of my kitchen. And if you cook, you'll recognize those, maybe not just like that, but <laughs> you'll recognize what it does. It catches the good stuff so I don't waste it, and it lets all that other stuff flow right through and down the drain. Now, if I think of the Word of God as the filter through which every other idea and every concept is to be filtered, then I have a framework for discerning what is right and just and true. What's good, according to the Word of God, I'm going to keep, and every other idea I'm going to filter through this, and if it doesn't fit, I'm going to let it fall through those cracks. That's loving God with all your mind. Now think about it, because we live in a culture um, where we have access to so much information, so many ideas, some are good, others not so much. Romans 12, 2 reminds us that we're not to be conformed to this world, but rather we're to be renewed by the transformation of our minds so that we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his pleasing and perfect will. Filtering what we hear, what we see through God's word is the best way to love the Lord our God with all our mind. That's what Solomon was talking about. All the way back in the Old Testament, the ability to understand what's right and just and fair through the acceptance of God's word. Make sense? Excellent. So you're going to remember the filter, right? Would you do me a favor? Would you forget the dirty filter? Because that's not God's word. That's my strainer. <laughs> Lastly, love the Lord your God with all your strength. We live in a culture that neither knows God nor honors him. And it says, but you... You hold on to God with all your strength because living successfully is dependent on it. Now, living successfully doesn't just have to do with how much wealth we amass or how um, successful our business is. It has to do with our character in every aspect of our lives. Now, every time I consider this, two men come to mind. You heard one of them last week, Glenn Huff. But the second is George Selden, and you won't know his name from anybody. But George was my husband's commander when we were living overseas, and George was just different. That's the best way I know how to put it. Many of my husband's commanders were very politically driven. Some followed the rules exhaustively when it was to their benefit, not so much when it wasn't. And you couldn't necessarily count on them backing you or supporting you in any situation where it was going to affect their ability to rise through the ranks. Some of you live that. Some of you have been there. George was different in that in every single situation, you could count on him. If he said he would do something or if he said he would look into something, he would do it. If you took a problem to him, he took the time to talk through it with you and he never held against you the fact that you didn't know what to do. He was fair, he was just in his dealings with everyone, and he was not afraid to take difficult issues to those above him in rank when he knew something was not right or when he felt like someone was being mistreated. He was the kind of officer that you wanted to serve under and under, and his life was so different that I remember him 35 years later. Now, that's an incredible character that someone would remember that long. That's the kind of reputation, though, that we're called to have in every aspect of our lives. Everything under our sphere of influence should be well-ordered because that's the task of God, to bring order out of chaos, right? He's still working on me. Thank you, Lord. But also to bring everyone under our influence to feel safe and valued, and especially so when we come to our work lives. Paul writes in Colossians 3, 23 to 24, that when we work, we should do it as if we're working for the Lord himself, so that whatever we do should be of highest caliber. Solomon wants his sons to understand that, 
And so it gives them some very practical ways to remember the importance of that work ethic, especially as it has to do with the effect on their families. There's the lesson of the ant. Now, can't you just imagine him pulling his son aside and going to go look at an ant hill and saying, son, look, look how each ant is steadily work, working there. They're gathering food so that every single ant will have what it needs, so the rest of the colony will have what it needs. Look how diligently they work, son. That's the way to work, son. Or going out into the field where farmers are hard at work, seed is being sown, harvests are being reaped in their season, and Solomon says, look, son, don't forget. Those who work their land are going to have plenty to eat. And then he makes some really stinging comments about those who don't work their land. Listen to these. Um, or take care of their business. Have you ever known anybody that was a big talker? but didn't do anything about it. You don't have to mention any names. You can call somebody to mind. All right, Solomon warns his son about that. He says, those who chase fantasies have no sense. Right out of scripture, no joke. He says, it's hard work that brings a profit. Mere talk just leads to poverty. And this is kind of stunning. He says, son, one who is slack in his work is related not to God, but to the one who destroys. Who might that be? Yeah. Ow. And remember that the way we conduct our work is a reflection on this God that we profess to serve. And finally he says, the bottom line is this, if they don't take care of their work lives, son, their families are going to go hungry. So son, you get your priorities right. You do things in the right time, in the right season, son. Perhaps then Solomon takes him in to see the books of his business. And he says, son, some, of, some are going to try and get you to take shortcuts in your business, to take advantage of people rather than dealing with them honestly. But son, I want you to remember this. The Lord detests and wealth is worthless on that day when we're judged. And so son, you do it right. You do it right. In fact, it says the one who is skilled at their work will serve before kings. So, son, you be the one that does it right. Church, you be the ones that do it right. Now, if those things came easily, we wouldn't have very much to talk about, would we? I love your grins. So, Solomon identifies several appetites that need to be disciplined if we're going to lead a successful life. And some of you are getting really uncomfortable. He says, watch what you say. Don't let any corrupt words come out of your mouth. Jesus says those things to us in the New Testament as well. He says it's those things that are in us and come out of us that corrupt us. And he adds, let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. Do what you say you will do. And the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 29, don't let any unwholesome Talk come out of your mouths, only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, so that it is of benefit to those who hear. And he writes in 1 Corinthians 3 that we're going to be judged for every idle word that we speak. So we better use our words wisely, right? Yeah, ouch. Solomon had it right all the way back then. Watch what you say. Watch that appetite. Second, he said, son, let your eyes look straight ahead. Make sure that your gaze is directly before you. Now I'm from the great state of Kentucky, home of the Kentucky Derby, and there is a great illustration there from the racing world. Because when a horse is going to be put into a race, they put blinders on it so it can't see anything but straight ahead so they can't see what's to the right and what's to the left because what's going on on either side can distract them from running their best race and the apostle paul writes you're in a race too and so we're headed in one direction we're headed toward eternity and it's really easy to become distracted if we don't keep our gaze in the right place and so for a successful life you make sure you're looking straight at eternity right Lastly, he says, you be careful what you eat and drink. Don't join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. I love the blunt way Solomon writes. You want a good laugh sometime, pick those up and read them. 
you, know, you, you look at those things and think, are those really written in the Bible? Yes, they are. Here's a prime example. If you find honey, eat just enough, too much of it, and you'll vomit. It's, it's in the Bible. Seriously. Watch what you eat. It's graphic, but it gets the point across, doesn't it? There's no doubt about what he means there. The bottom line to all those appetites, the words we speak, the things we see, the things that we're to put in our bodies is this. The person who lacks self-control is like a city whose walls are broken down. We end up with no defenses, and so anything and everything has access to us through those weaknesses. It can ruin our health. It can ruin our relationships, our businesses, and even life itself. He says self-discipline, controlling those appetites is absolutely necessary. Finally, somebody should say amen. There is the lesson of the lion. This is my lion. <laughs> okay. Um, I found this guy sitting on the clearance rack at Kroger, and he didn't have any price on him. So I took him to the cashier, and I said, how much? And she said, $4. And I said, sold. <laughs> Only then did I stop and, and think, why are you buying this? I didn't have any children at home. My grandson hadn't been born. I'd quit teaching. There was absolutely no reason for me to purchase this line. It was a ri ridiculous, absurd purchase, except he's cute, isn't he? <laughs> you want to pet him after service, you're welcome to. Solomon writes that some of our excuses for not doing the things that we should do are even more absurd than buying that line. He writes the sluggard says, there's a line outside, or I'll be murdered in the street. Now, in Solomon's time, there was the tiniest element of possibilities in each of these. I'll be murdered in the streets, for example. This is the golden age of Israel. Strong government, societies well-ordered. It's about the safest time that Israel had ever encountered. I'll be murder murdered in the street? Yeah, probably not likely. Bad excuse. When it comes to doing what is right and just and fair, we can let a lot of fears keep us from speaking and from acting. But Christ says this, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And yes, Jesus mentions hell. The lesson's clear. Don't let anybody or anything stop you from living in a way that's right, from doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done. Fearing the right thing which is fearing whom? Because it's the beginning of wisdom. wisdom. You know, as we finish, I want to backtrack to that first excuse. There's a lion out there. <laughs> well, the truth is there is a lion out there. There are several lions out there, probably not the physical kind that the sluggard might worry about, but the kinds that we should surely worry about. Peter writes that the devil prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. And every single time we make a choice to live a life of lesser integrity, we give him a broken down wall through which he can walk straight into our lives and wreak havoc. That's one lion. The antidote is to allow a different lion to reign within. He's the one they call the Lion of Judah, the one purposed from the beginning of time to reign forever in a kingdom that will never, ever end, the one who has defeated every single enemy, including the ones that you encounter on a daily basis. That's the lion that you want Amen. within. <coughs> the choice, though, is yours. Which lion will you allow to reign.